thank you for coming in this stormy weather tonight. I appreciate it. And welcome to Park Forum. Uh, we're excited tonight to be welcoming Dr. Catherine Isbister. I should have asked you how to pronounce that. Is that right? Good. She's a professor at UCSC's Department of Computational Media. And she was actually the founding director of the Game Innovation Lab at NYU. I don't know if you're going to tell us a little bit more about that tonight. I was here during the sound check, and it sounds like there's going to be a party in here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody started to dance <laughs> in the hall. Um, so as you see from her title and the description, she focuses on emotion and social connection when trying to design a uh, technology experience for people. Um, and I'll let her sort of take it from there. Yeah, thank Great. you for coming. All right. Well, thanks for braving the weather to be here. I have to say that when I was a PhD student at Stanford, I used to come to these talks and I just remember being in awe of the speakers and I just felt so happy driving here that I got to be on this side of the podium. So I'm glad you came to see the talk. Um, as you mentioned, I'm now at UC Santa Cruz. Before that, I was at NYU uh, where I founded a place called the Game Innovation Lab and the group that I formed at UC Santa Cruz is called the Social and Emotional Technology Lab. And I wanted to talk to you all today about something I feel very passionate about that's going on in technology and what I'm trying to do to change it. So here's the challenge <laughs> that I've taken up in my research group. Um, I'm sure that you're all really familiar with this kind of situation, you know, sitting around the dinner table and everybody is inexorably drawn to their mobile phone because there's things to check out or there's someone else who's not there who's trying to communicate with you. Um, you know, even when you're maybe on vacation and you're relaxing with someone you care very much about, still there's this incredible pull when you're in the moment with people nowadays to be following into the world of technology. Um, and it can even become comical like this, right? You know, these people are out on a boat ride, presumably they're there because they want to be in nature, and yet they're not really uh, taking part in it. Um, and, you know, you get a group of, of friends together, you're all sitting around, and then somehow all of you here and there start drifting into your phones. It's um, something that happens to us all. Um, so what I think is going on is increasingly we're finding it more and more challenging to be co-present with one another in the moment. And without meaning to, we've started to develop technology in such a way that it's encouraging us into this drift away from being present with each other. And this is something that I've become very concerned about and that I feel as an academic researcher um, this is the sort of thing that we sit down, we take a step back, we look at the landscape and we think about what's happening and maybe try to make an intervention in what's going on, thinking deeply about why and trying to figure out how to tinker with things to maybe shift things in a different direction. Now, especially for those of you who are younger in the audience, you may be saying to yourself, oh, for Pete's sake, like, it's the same old rant from older people. Like, you know, social media is amazing. It allows us to share um, our feelings about things. Um, it allows us to, you know, blow off steam about things that are going on in our world. Um, we're inventing new art forms with this. Uh, we figured out all these incredible different ways to communicate with each other, to set up social networks, you know, things that are location-based. And I agree. I think all that is amazing. But I think what it's done is it's kind of tipped us. We've become a little too you know, non-present communication heavy uh, because our tools make it really easy for us to do that. And we haven't thought really well about how to augment what's going on in person. So, you know, you can sort of count me in this camp of, you know, hey, when we make a change like this, a rapid change like this in, through technology and how we relate in society, then it behooves us now and then to take a step back and go, whoa, okay, what exactly are we doing? Is this something we want to be doing? And how do we think about this? So how many people have seen this image? Okay, a couple of people. This is basically a selfie by a macaque monkey. And there was actually this big argument about whether the monkey had the rights to its own image or not. It was this huge, you know, fracas online and, you know, got into photo rights and so forth. But Part of why this image is funny is because it's very unnatural. We normally don't see monkeys taking selfies of themselves. What we, our sort of canonical vision of what monkeys do is they hang out together in groups, 
and they groom each other and you know we see them in zoos or we see them on nature shows well you know we are also primates <laughs> and we like to do these things too right we like to hang out we like to cuddle we like to be with each other it's a very important part of being human at a biological level it's something that feels good and it's something that facilitates um, how we live and whether or not we thrive in fact and not only that but a huge part of who we are as humans who are also primates is we're tool makers and we're tool users and we use tools together so part of being together physically in the world is physically interacting to make things together that we couldn't make ourselves um, and I think this is all stuff that's starting to ebb away and slip out of what we're doing with our digital technology. If you think about what role technology could play, if you think what more broadly than digital technology and you think about things like musical instruments, over the centuries of crafting tools for ourselves, we have gone through phases where we've made tools that are exquisitely designed to facilitate in-person interaction to create beautiful aesthetic experiences and allow people to carefully and precisely coordinate, do really interesting and engaging things. You know, getting away from music, thinking about something like sports. Um, we've evolved these fine-tuned systems of technologies and designed interactions to create not only really engaging experiences for those who are acting out the sport, but also to create very engaging experiences for people who are spectating. And I personally think we can do this with digital technology as well. I think it's really time to take a step back and think about how is technology fitting into the ecosystem of our lives in person? And I've spent the last few years building games that try to get at different affordances of technologies that lead to better support and even enhancement of people's in-person interactions. And I think we're actually at a very interesting moment, technology-wise. So um, for a while, you know, we had desktop machines, then we had laptop machines, then there was the rise of the smartphone. And right now, we're at this moment where we're shaping where things like wearables and the Internet of Things are going. And I think we have this moment every time we get into a new wave of technology where we can take a step back and think well about what kinds of principles we want to put into that technology. And I think there have been some really interesting and kind of creepy failures around things like social wearables and Internet of Things. And I think it's very important for the technology community to take a step back and think, okay, what should we do? What can we do better? Where do we want this stuff to go? How do we want to facilitate being human? So you might be asking yourself, well, what does all this have to do with games? Why am I making games to ask these questions? Well, Interestingly, games create this sort of magic circle for people where they step in and they'll willingly take up any particular rule set. So it turns out to be a really wonderful test bed for exploring novel ways to augment social interaction. Because people will say, oh, okay, I'm playing a game, I'll try that out. And so you can very fluidly and readily get people to try out a different experience. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is several games that we designed um, in my lab at NYU that get at different affordances of technology that I think facilitate in-person social interaction better than some of the things we currently have. So, let me start with Yamuv. So, Yamuv is a project that got some funding from Yahoo Research, hence the name Yamuv. And they came to my group and they said, you know, we're really interested in, is there any way to use mobile technology to facilitate in-person interaction? What could we do to make the mobile phone work to help people feel closer together? Um, and we actually ended up building a dance game. So why did we build a dance game? Well, um, moving together, moving in synchrony, actually is a powerful way for people to build trust and connection. It's something that most cultures share. And in fact, how many people have actually been to, performed a wedding dance? Anybody in this audience? Okay, a couple of people. So this is kind of maybe an American tradition in certain pockets of America, but the idea is that both the bride's family and the groom's family all get together and they perform this dance. And at a very deep, you know, 
um, psychological and physical level, what's happening here is when you force people to get into synchrony, you're actually building trust and liking and connection between them through the very process of enacting this behavior. So we were thinking, okay, this is something that we could do, we could pull it off, and it could be really fun for people, and it's something we could do with mobile technology. Um, has anybody here played Dance Central or Just Dance or any of these? Okay, so a few people have. Okay, so typically what happens with dance games, computational dance games, is the paradigm is you're looking at a big screen, there's characters moving on the screen, and you're supposed to imitate those characters. What that does is it gets everyone staring at the screen. The spectators are staring, the players are staring, which is not really like the social experience of dance. If you've ever been dancing with people, normally you're making eye contact, you're improvising your own move, and all of that is what brings people into synchrony. So essentially you're attempting to synchronize with a computer. And there's definitely fun in that. It's not that that's not engaging, but it doesn't preserve some of the really interesting social functions of dance. So what we did was we took the mobile phones and instead of having people look at them, we built a constellation of technologies. So we simplified the interface on the mobile phone. We put it into a, a wrist holster on the person. So basically all that you saw on the phone was just sort of your score after a round. And then we, um, we used uh, uh, a server to show on a big screen what was happening during the dance battle for spectators. And we actually had a live MC calling out to the players how they were doing and what they should do next. So we basically broke apart the, uh, the feedback mechanism so that the dancers could focus all their attention on one another. They could hear how they were doing from the MC. The spectators could enjoy the two people dancing, but then they could also see this big screen that kind of heightened and magnified the experience of watching the play. Um, and it also allowed for improvisation, um, which is really important for people of different skill levels. So with something like Dance Central or Just Dance, basically you, know, you have to ramp yourself up through the predefined levels in the game. But in this game, the way that it's adjudicated is basically are your accelerometers signaled in sync? So it's a dance battle between two pairs. So does this pair have matching accelerometer signatures? And then did they keep up the pace of their movements and did they vary their movements versus the other team? So kind of self handicaps. So we've actually shown this game at a lot of game festivals. This is the Indicade Festival in Los Angeles. This is one that's the biggest peer reviewed game venue. Um, and we get one of the the person who DJed the game was actually this guy, Phil Fish, who's a very famous indie game developer. Anyway, you can see here, um, people just make out moves together, right? It's like, it's three rounds and it's best two out of three for the score. And so, they make up any move they want to. Um, they can air guitar, they can, you know, swim, whatever they want to do. Um, which means that when you decide to play with someone, you get to quickly improvise a move that's going to make both of you look Right? Um, and then, in order to practice the move, you have to closely coordinate. And the research shows that that's how people do build trust and liking and movement synchrony, is through this like micro-negotiation as they go along. And typically, one person will sort of become the leader, one will become the follower, and you kind of get a groove with that person. And the scoring is done for the pair rather than for the individuals, which is, which is different than most of the other console dancing games. So all of this sort of works together to make it really flexible and really collaborative and really engaging. So that pair you just saw was like a mom and her daughter coming back from a soccer game. And then these two, the one on the left is a dancer on TV. And so, you know, people like at these radically different levels to play this game together. So basically, putting this example forward to show you if you break apart the sensing and the actuating and you think really well about which affordances to provide in what ways to people, you can create a radically different social atmosphere for people, right? And you can use a mechanism that you know from research about human beings brings people together to actually craft a flexible and engaging experience for people in person. So this is a radically different thing than most of the things you would normally see on your mobile phone. And 
the other aspect of this project was us recognizing we may have to pull apart technologies, not just accept one package, like mobile phone, but think mobile phone plus server plus big screen plus a human playing the MC in order to unlock really interesting, engaging interactions that are important to uh, people. Okay. So that's Yamu. The second project I want to talk about was a collaboration with Alcatel Lucent Bell Labs in New Jersey. And this project was, um, they gave us an interesting challenge. They were really interested. They told us, you know, surveillance cameras, most of them are actually IP based at this point. And we're really interested in thinking about, is there any way that these things could move from being about surveillance and being about sort of, you know, the invisible, looking down on the vulnerable, and could be something like a public utility that people would want to use, maybe even to author for, you know, would you help us think about this since you all are so playful? And they actually had the software they had developed that would analyze the motion from the video stream very rapidly and that we were able to use as a game mechanic. So we said, okay, that's a really interesting challenge. And they were planning to do an exhibition at this Liberty Science Center, which is in New Jersey. And it was all about surveillance, surveillance technology. And so essentially we worked with the museum to take over one of the cameras that was inside the museum in a public hallway and think about what could we do to activate people, to get them to collaborate together and respond to a surveillance camera in a different way. So this is what we came up with. These are two of my graduate students who worked on the project. It's called Pixel Motion, and essentially what you do is anytime anyone moves into the field of view of the surveillance camera, they start wiping pixels off of the screen. When enough pixels have been wiped off, you get a digital postcard with props that you can pose with. And then that digital postcard goes onto a leaderboard and also goes into a, a a photo stream on Flickr that people can utilize. So I'll show you a little video. So you can see the progress bar on the left. And we tuned it um, to work for the kids who were coming into the museum, like find the right number of pixels that they could realistically uncover. So you had a little time during the photo part where you could prop pose with the props and kind of do silly things. And then yeah, your picture would go on the leaderboard. And on the top right, you can see that motion detection software working. Um, so what we did was we developed three different themed postcards. We had the New Jersey Shore, we had a skyscraper one, and then we had a moon themed one because it was a tech museum. And basically the thing was running all the time in the background. So this was the hallway people had to pass through to get to exhibits. And they would pick up on the sound or they would also pick up on the fact that um, they'd see a little motion happening as they moved by, and then they'd start to play the game, and it was a quick cycle. Uh, and basically, um, we were able to double purpose the surveillance camera, also do research on how people responded to this thing. So we collected data for a couple of weeks. We did analytics about the game, and we also did video analysis of how people were engaging with it. Before we started the project, we looked around the museum and we watched how people interacted with other exhibits at the museum. And a pattern that we noticed that was verified by other people at the museum was typically how groups interact with something in a museum is. One group will approach, they'll engage with it, and then other groups will sort of politely wait and you know try not to get in the field of view of the thing. And part of this is because the way we've designed sensing technology is to try to couple with people very tightly, but to kind of fail at that frequently. So people have become very sensitive to sensing envelopes and they'll kind of stay out of the way so as not to cause trouble. And there's all these social norms about not mingling groups. So what we were hoping with this exhibition was because it was a free for all, because it was just motion flow analysis, that way we would get people running in and breaking in and interacting and disturbing the kind of you know, interpersonal space that you would normally see at a museum. And we did in fact see that. Um, you know, we saw a lot of, um, chaining of behavior and like one person would come in then another and then another um, we were a little worried when we went into the data analysis of oh, how are we going to be able to tell which is a group and which is not but fortunately i had no idea this is the case but at this museum i guess a lot of kids field trips to museums they put them in all the same color t-shirt 
So it turned out to be much easier than we thought to figure out who's mingling with who. And so you can see, for example, in this middle row, um, you can see that the kids in the green t-shirts just jump in and start playing with the kids in the red t-shirts. And we saw lots of that. We saw a lot of mingling of groups. And then the last thing we saw that was really pretty funny was we saw a lot of photo bombing behavior. So basically, like kids would come running in after the round had been won and then jump in to pose with the props. Um, so what I want you to take away from this project is this notion that um, we make assumptions with our sensing strategies that can actually get in the way of people collaborating and connecting to one another. So this project was started out you know, to try to get away from this you know, one-way interaction with these cameras that people see everywhere and make them think about and feel, okay, maybe I could make use of this thing, maybe this thing could be interesting in other contexts. And we have thought about, we developed this in HTML5, and there's really no reason we couldn't do you know, pop-up experiences like this in urban environments and just sort of you know, take over, an, you know, use an IP stream that's available publicly and just make a game happen on the spot, right? So that's the kind of thing that we were thinking about. Um, but also, it really got me thinking at a deeper level about um, sensing strategies and how interaction and sensing relate and how our bias tends to be, we need to create very precise sensing of individuals. But I think that bias may actually lead us to further uh, look away from opportunities to connect people. So there may be ways we can use sensing like this motion sensing to do really interesting things. We don't have to wait till we have perfect tracking of individuals. We can do quite interesting things and create interesting social experiences for people without that. But it requires really thinking in that way. Um, okay, so that's pixel motion. The last project that I wanted to talk about tonight is a game called Hotaru. And this was a collaboration with an artist and indie game developer named Kaho Abe. And um, this is when I was in New York. And uh, we got a little grant from this place called iBeam, which is an arts and technology center. And they passed us money from the Rockefeller Cultural Innovation Fund. So the overall project was called Computational Fashion. And the idea was basically New York has this huge fashion industry. It has a burgeoning you know, tech industry, but they never connect and fashion is inevitably kind of behind the wave of technology. And yet we've got these things like wearables coming along and why is it that we're not connecting? How do we make that happen? So they gave uh, little chunks of money to artists, scientists, pairs to work on interesting projects. Um, so Kaho's um, games are wearable style games. She makes wearables and she creates these kind of crazy interactive experiences where people are forced to deal with one another. Um, like an example I can give you is she has this game called Hit Me, which ha you each wear a hard hat and then it's got a camera on the top with a doorbell push above it and you're trying to push the other person's doorbell on their head, okay? So it creates this funny interaction where people are jumping up and trying to push on the other person's head. Um, and if you succeed, you take a picture of the other person and that's how you get a point. So this is what she does. She also has a background in uh, fashion technology. Um, so we think about wearables and how they're being deployed today, even when they have a bit of a fashionable edge, like how many people have seen this? This just came out. This is um, the Snap uh, Spectacles. So uh, these are like almost like a, a revisiting of Google Glass, but instead of recording things all the time, they record small uh, snippets of video, and then it make, it's very, very easy to share them on social media. And I mean, they're certainly more kind of fashionable maybe than Google Glass was, um, but still the emphasis here is on enabling network social communication, right, rather than necessarily augmenting what's going on in person. Um, so Kaho and I, like I've done a lot of my past work on games and game characters and avatars and understanding what goes on for people in games. Kaho is also very interested, the both of us, in how people relate to their avatars and how avatars provide a kind of fanciful fantasy experience for people where they get to explore different parts of themselves. So this is, this is taken from a series of photos by Robbie Cooper that was in the New York Times and he, he, it's a fascinating you know, photo essay of people and their avatars. Do their avatars look like them or different than them, um, you know, in different games and so forth. So 
she was really intrigued by, could we create some feeling like that in real life? Um, and she was also inspired by this television show. She grew up in Japan, and um, there was this show called The Co Common Writers. And, it, and what she found intriguing about the show was that um, the common writers, they would have a costume, and then they could unlock the potential in that costume by taking on a gesture, you know, by striking a pose. And so she's like, well, this is really cool, you know, because this sort of gets you into feeling like that character kind of unlocks your powers. So she made these wearables. She made, um, she made them in the lab, and we have a 3D printer. Um, basically, the sort of the guts of them is actually a phone. And then she was using processing to program uh, what the wearables would do. And she 3D printed the, um, the, what do you call them, spikes, I guess, and the, the pieces in the backpack. So the two wearables, one is a gauntlet that you wear on your arm, and the other is a backpack that goes on the other player's back. And essentially how the game works is rather, again, similar to um, Yamove, rather than being screen-based for players, it's all happening through the gestures and through the lights and the sound, and that's how you're figuring out what's going on. Um, the story, the backstory is you're, two light, you're the last two lightning bugs in the world, and you're fighting off evil smog, and you have to work together to get rid of the smog. And so the person who has the backpack has to make these sort of, sorry, chi gathering gestures to gather energy, and as they do, the lights fill up in the backpack, but of course they can't see it, so it requires the other person to watch closely. Then when the backpack is full, they say, okay, and then they have to join the other hand to transfer the energy. And then it slowly fills up the gauntlet and you see lights and you hear sound. And then the second player has to do this, you know, arm raising gesture and then you hear this and then the, the fog is fading. And so the whole thing is a cycle of doing this over and over again and kind of performing the role of these two last lightning bugs in the world. Um, so Kaho built this thing and then my job was to try to figure out how can we study the impact of this? Is it really causing people to bond, to connect, and how does that relate to the game mechanic? So we tried out all kinds of different things. And uh, one of the techniques we used was we started to take these before and after snapshots of people when they would play. And we would look at their body language with each other, kind of, you know, are they leaning towards each other? Are they touching in any way? Are they smiling or not smiling? Do they have um, symmetrical gestures to one another? Like, are they physically moving in similar ways? Uh, and we did coding of this, and we also um, farmed it out to Mechanical Turk and had people rate how close did these people seem to be. And the overall pattern was you could see a clear uptick both in our own coding and also in the Mechanical Turk coding in terms of how affiliative people seemed to be after the experience. And of course, we also interviewed them and they said all kinds of things about the mechanics and how they worked for them. Uh, things like, you know, we have to rely on each other. We can't do this without each other. We had to communicate. We learned how to communicate more. Um, and then I really like this quote, the connective cooperative energy of playing the game created an isolated moment where working together was the apex of expression. We have now done something together where holding hands was the only way to connect. So I think there's a lot of interesting material in this project, and it's something that we're working with, continuing to work with in my lab at Santa Cruz. We're actually um, now working with people who uh, do live action role playing, and we're designing social wearables that they can take into those multi-day experiences to augment what's going on for them and figure out ways to study how that works. Um, Kotaru, it's playful. The wearables are asymmetric. <coughs> They're interdependent. Um, they don't require a lot of attention on text turning away from one another. Instead, there's a kind of imperative to orient closely toward one another physically and even to connect physically. So there are a lot of very different things going on in this game that are quite far away in terms of design space from what we're seeing in social wearables today. Typically, what we see are things that are being sold that are identical, maybe like little color differences and things, and that function individually with a heavy emphasis on social networking and collecting, processing one's own data. So I hope that this game helps you see this alternate design space for thinking about what could wearable technology do for people? How could it 
um, bring them together in interesting ways and allow them a little distance to play out interesting interactions with one another that might not otherwise be possible. So I hope these projects give you a sense of the work that I've been doing in my lab and kind of just to take a step back, I want to reiterate and say this overall series of work is really about noticing that right now technology seems to be drawing us away from focusing on each other in the moment and thinking about with the rise of wearables and Internet of Things and these cameras everywhere and sensors, how could we start to use this ecology of sensing and of devices to better augment how we interact with one another, to be playful with each other, to have all kinds of different experiences with each other, to sort of stop being at cross purposes uh, with ourselves and with noticing and being present with one another. Um, I want to conclude by saying, in case you know games isn't your thing and you're not quite sure, okay, how does this all really relate to working in everyday life, um, to non-game contexts, that I've actually been thinking quite deeply about this. I'm part of an initiative uh, at Stanford called the Future of Working Workers. And one of the things we're doing in my lab, this is actually a co-work space in Berlin that I really like. Um, there's a lot of things changing about how people work together right now, and, and there's an opportunity space for thinking about how to better facilitate co-presence. And so I'm happy to talk about some of that if anybody has any questions. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Can you put your mic to the These aren't really organized questions, but just a few of them I thought of. So a lot of the feedback that you're giving to the participants has to then be sound and mm -hmm. vibration rather than yeah. video, you know, except for the one where you're, but again, that game, the middle game, they were playing with the screen again. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, one thread that I didn't introduce here is um, I think big screens are really good uh, if you don't create a lot of micro detailed feedback. And s I think big screens and sound are good for creating ambiance and creating a sense of a world that can envelop people but still allow them to be very deeply co-present, right? Um, but I think, uh, I think it has to do with, you know, uh, how much focus you're asking of people and to which things, right? and thinking about um, what's the overall aesthetic and emotional experience you're trying to get them to have, and then just tightening that and taking away anything else. And I think a big problem for technologists is we tend to accept the device's constraints too readily and too quickly, and we often end up developing something that has those latent biases, which in my opinion are very old, and they have to do with solitary focused work at a desk. I'm not moving. I'm not trying to attend to other people. And, you know, that we can create conversational, quick, really entertaining things that happen through that portal. And we've done that with social media, but we haven't exploded out those affordances well to think about augmenting what's happening in the moment. And as you accept those biases, you work within the biases, and the bias narrows and narrows. And exactly. And it also is an easier development path. So the other thing I've done a lot of is working with indie game developers and DIY people. And they are chasing an aesthetic. They are not enamored of a particular technology. They haven't made a commitment to a particular platform. And so they'll just throw anything out the window that doesn't deliver the aesthetics they're after. And what I've learned from them is a much more bricolage approach. Fine, I'll use the mobile phone, and we're only going to use it for the accelerometer and the wireless. We don't even care that it has a screen, right? Or I'm going to use a live person to give feedback, even though we also have a giant screen, because it's not appropriate for people to stare at the screen, and they can't focus on their moves. You know, so it's thinking it's okay to have redundant feedback for different people in the mix, right? And it's okay to think about atmosphere. And also, it's good to think about a more flexible coupling between the machines and the people. And so Yamove is an example, because it allows improvisation, you get a much wider range of uh, highly engaging interaction without having to develop a lot of highly tuned content. And then engage the people that are participating and the people that are observing. Yes. And have the observers actually participate in a separate, different way. Yeah, exactly. Like to have those multiple layers going on. I mean, another challenge with this kind of work is prototyping and testing it. Because you have to sort of 
You have to co-travel with a social atmosphere where people are willing to actually try this thing out, where it's genuine and it's not very forced. So part of this kind of work is finding audiences and venues. And an interesting thing about indie game developers is they have these playtest communities where they go, and also festivals are a form of extended beta testing and playtesting. So there are these wonderful atmospheres for actually testing the socio-technical material of the whole thing, right? Yeah, no, that's right. No, that's very true. And then a technological question. You mentioned the phone for the accelerometer. Yes. Is there any possibility of using the camera on the phone or something like making it using the one of those where you watch you dance? Yeah, so I think you, you could do that. Application on my phone, I put the application on your phone, and it would watch you, and it would watch me, and then you know, by sound feedback, how we're doing together, yeah. rather than just the one parameter of the accelerometer. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you could do that. I think it takes thinking about it and executing on it, right? And in order to do that, you have to be thinking about that social atmosphere and wanting to use the affordances to get after those effects, but absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I noticed that um, the three examples are sort of somewhat like liminal, right? Like there are these spaces that they're entering for a short period of time, a festival, mm -hmm. uh, yes. a, a lobby of a museum or something. Yes. And it, it seems like as, as many things are being, so the, the opening critique of sort of in general, like social media and things like this, like this is asynchronous mm -hmm. and sort of always mm -hmm. and being applied to all kinds of things. Yes. Like a lot of people are saying like politics is now a spec, yes. like, or not even a spectator sport, but just like more like wrestling or some sort of sport. Yeah. So like everything is being invaded and gamification is the word that some people use. But I'm wondering, um, do you have any uh, thoughts or examples of how the sort of uh, co-located kind of like trust building type mm -hmm. of experiences translate into sort of rather than like these liminal spaces in sort of like everyday in asynchronous kind of patterns. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes sense. I don't know so much about asynchronous. I mean, I think that's an interesting space to explore. Mm -hmm. But in terms of extending the time window and thinking about non-magic cir circle type experiences, that's exactly why we're working with the LARP community now because they go on multi-day adventures together and they're trying to sustain a fiction with each other over several day period. And so what we're trying to do now is instrument their interactions. They try to hold social frames together, like you know, point structures or you know, plot moment type things where they have to manage people's attention and also kind of keep stats of a certain sort that are deeply social stats. And so we think those are both very promising things uh, that could extend into everyday life. So I'll give you an example of one of the things we were playing around with is designing, it's a futuristic Battlestar Galactica thing, like designing these epaulets that have lights on them and also vibration underneath so that when everyone needs to attend to someone in particular, they vibrate a little bit and then you look around and you see who's flashing, right? Uh, and you could use something like this also, like let's say it's a meeting setting, let's say this becomes something that's an interesting accessory for people. You could set a timer on everyone's epaulets so that when the meeting is starting to end, you get these kind of little flashy things. You know, there's that thing where no one can leave the meeting and it's awkward and there's this little social, so you can start to imagine wearables as arbitrating in subtle ways, social frames we set for ourselves and providing a function that releases us all, for example, from refereeing those kinds of moments. So, but to get to that place, you have to, you have to prototype and you have to test in legitimate social environments. And I think that's a huge issue with this kind of technology. And that is why we end up designing these. We have to design the social situation along with the tech, so to speak. So we're in this process of engaging with different social settings that will get us to be able to ask those questions. I mean, if you think about you know, Park and the whole U Ubicomp thing back in the day, I mean, people here could all just sort of adopt you know, the pads and tabs and whatnot and just use them for a while and get a feel for it. Well, that's the kind of situations that we're trying to look for, but if we're trying to create an ephemeral social support, uh, we have to find a context in which it feels real to people and they have a reason to adopt it. So I hope that starts to get at your question. Yeah. Hi, 
Do you think constantly changing media from a, a digital device is like a drug where people, um, once they start getting it, they need more and more to have the same effect so that, you know, if in the, when you have a family and everyone's looking at their device, it's because the uh, just the person the person interaction isn't as kind of stimulating to them as something that's constantly changing or new tweets that are constantly coming up. I think it's like um, all media are like bonbons. Like they're they're they they appeal to us. They're we've crafted them as tools to engage us, right? And that it's kind of a double-edged sword. So it's like you know, cinema is like falling into a dream, and it's wonderful, but then you could fall into it forever and never come out, and that's not so great, right? So I think we're constantly creating these really amazing aesthetic experiences that we then have to step back from and rebalance ourselves with, you know? So I do think, you know, the proliferation of individual screens and highly mesmerizing content is a big challenge for human beings, right? It, it is very mesmerizing. And then you've got the whole partial reinforcement thing where you get lots of interesting stuff coming through, you know, but I think we're tool makers and media makers and that's what we do. And so typically we don't throw the media out the window after we've made them. What we do is we figure out how to counterbalance what's happening with other things that redirect and re-engage us. And I, I personally think that the nature of consumer culture is fragmenting in terms of selling more and more individual devices and managing individual attention. So that's why, like, as a researcher, I think it's really important to push the social atmosphere side because it, I don't think the market will address it very well. So I think there are also some hidden biases in you know, our culture and how we buy and sell things that, that lead us down that path, you know? Because if we don't see it as a measurable common good and, uh, and it's not a marketing opportunity, then it gets tricky, you know, to enforce it, if that makes sense. Uh, the video, the, the screen's also really soothing. If you watch on campus, mm -hmm. people that are afraid they, they focus on their screen and they've got somebody that's watching over them in their mm -hmm. little screen. Yeah. Um, so that's... It. Well, it keeps you from feeling alone. I think it, it's like you have others who are with you, they're just not there. Right. And you it know, and it's reassuring. Because if mm -hmm. somebody's monitoring you, the bad guys are less apt to attack you because they're being watched. Yeah, too. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why I sort of tried to start out with why memes and social media. They're really amazing tools. It's just then we need to weave that back into the things that we want to maintain about being human that can erode when that becomes too much of our landscape, right? Well, and that, our, our social interactions are usually sequential. You talk, then mm -hmm. I talk. And so maybe we could build it so that my phone communicates with my friends that leads us to, we used to play a game in bars that were too loud, um, with the pencil, pencil conversations. And so we'd pass around bits of paper and you'd write something and the next one you got, you'd answered that one. Mm -hmm. And it was a fun game mm -hmm. and sequential and led these funny paths. Yes. And so if you could build something like that, that we would then have to communicate through the phone actively. That yeah, absolutely. And people do it. People blend. Like my students, like I've had them send me emails while I'm lecturing. And like sometimes I'll email them back like in a break and be like, why are you emailing me in class? And they're like, oh, you know, it's just you know, you can use it as, or you can orchestrate it, you know, but the point is why not kind of design from that premise instead of working against the flow of the tools, like really unpack them and, you know, consciously make new forms. <laughs> uh, okay, quick, quick in defense of millennials. I'm like right on the edge, so I gotta defend millennials if I can. Uh, first, I, I, I took a different meaning and then of what you said about um, sort of it is a defensive mechanism. I use my phone almost every single day as a, a wonderful tool to avoid talking to people. Sure. And to be fair, there were a lot of things, there were a lot of human interactions people were having for thousands of years that they'd rather not have. Yes. We can judge whether or not that's good or bad or healthy yes. or unhealthy, yeah. but when someone's on the street with a clipboard and mm -hmm. I've already donated money to Amnesty International and I yes. don't want to have to talk to them again, I have a fake phone call 
and then they don't bother me, and I'm just like, hey, and I smile, yes. like, oh, right? This whole, like, that's great. That mm -hmm. is a defense mechanism in a different way. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, um, yeah. Second, in like, in cities, you often see people just, you know, standing at a bus stop or whatever. So this is possibly a signal that, like, our urban landscape has failed to capture our attention mm -hmm. and or, again, a social sort of defense mechanism. I think defense is a really, mm -hmm. I don't want to overly militarize the, but, but, but you know, it's, it's an avoidance or, or whatever, yeah. uh, controlling your mm -hmm. own time, which as you increasingly fragment yourself across these, you know, virtual spaces and, you know, whatever, the idea that you can kind of have some control whether it's illusory or an illusion at all, like, mm -hmm. fine. Um, but then my, my question to you is, in terms of avoiding these sorts of, I think a lot of them become almost like Skinner boxes in a way, mm -hmm. where like, mm -hmm. it, you just get this hit, this hit, this hit, this hit. Um, and I noticed that you have a different form of mediation or sort of a, a the, the, uh, the goal is very different. It's, it's one of connection or something, but there's still some form of quantification involved. Mm -hmm. And where you had quantification, like in the dance game, you either sort of obscured it or it was mediated through somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it feels yeah. like right now we live in a place where some of these technologies that we're sort of harping on, rightly or wrongly, kind of tend to strangely quantify those things and or make it a direct report rather than a mediated mm -hmm. experience. No, and I I'm think just that's wondering true. if, yeah, if you I think those are two different strands. Yeah. I think like one of them is our relationship to place has changed profoundly and we don't sort of congregate around neighbors and communities as much. We have like fragmented communities of people from many different phases of our lives and we move different places. And so uh, we're managing that a lot of the time and we're using tech to manage that. But I guess, you know, in a way I'm kind of weighing the scale the other way to say we're still flesh and blood and we still are deeply um, like you know the study about the monkeys and how there's the wire monkey and the fur monkey bait mama and they take away the mama and the baby the baby monkey prefers the furry one that has no milk coming out of it to the wire one that has milk because it needs touch and I think uh, there's probably a reason one in six of us is on antidepressants, which partly has to do with our technology has been stripping away that very satisfying, synchronizing and co-presence that we don't even realize is nourishing us on a very deep level, right? So it's sort of like, I completely agree with you. We use it in these situations to kind of manage uh, unwanted social encounters, but that perversely we might benefit from more slightly unwanted localized social encounters in the sense that we might actually thrive better. And so that's like a huge open question too. It's like, how do you measure that, et cetera. The other thing that you brought up was, was measurement and kind of like this sort of quantification and acceleration and kind of micromanaging of one's data. And I think you're right to point out that's another strand that I kind of shy away from, even though we make games, they're not highly metricized, they're not highly cognitive strategic type things because I do think, because computers process numbers really well and sensors, like we typically go, oh, let's put a sensor in, oh, it can track this. Okay, let's get people fixated on tracking that. Like that's a really you know, low hanging fruit of an interaction, but do they need to track that and why? What, what is it adding to their life, right? And then you try to get multiple people to get excited about tracking that same thing and comparing themselves. It's all very kind of ham handed, if you will. And so I think it's, you know, requires stepping back and saying, why would you want to track something? What, what is it about the quality of your experience that you're wanting to improve or shift? You know what I mean? And sort of looking at other registers for creating reward or drawing people's attention to certain things. So I think that that's just another strand and they're kind, in a way they're kind of orthogonal. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you talked about uh, um, connection, I mean, connection between human and human, mm -hmm. but in our life, uh, AI and robots are come more and more coming. Mm -hmm. And my question is, so like uh, people build trust each other by dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, do mm -hmm. you think we can apply that kind of theory into um, robot or AI um, and human interaction? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we could go a lot further in 
building robots and AI that are deeply improvisational in subtle ways with people, I think that's a really underexplored challenge. And I think it might lead to more interesting moment to moment experiences for people. So I think there's a lot of focus on comprehension or problem solving, you know, task based interaction, but that why many of those interactions are so unsatisfying is because there's very little work done on the coupling between the person and the system moment to moment and how that feels, whether it's fun or not, you know, how does it stretch this way and that. Like I would, did a postdoc in Japan and I was at NTT, but I was across the street from ATR where there was a lot of robotic work and there was this giant robot there and I was talking to this guy who had gotten the robot to play a perfect game of tennis, you know. I was like, well, I think you should get that robot to do sticky hands Tai Chi with people because that would really, like getting this really large robot to just perfectly adjust forces with someone would really shift the relationship, right, between the person and the machine and would be a very interesting technical challenge too. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to be done there. Thank you, thank you for coming. Ah, thank you. Thank you. There are light snacks outside if you're interested in some popcorn or cookies or something like that. Um, and I think you're here for another yeah, 20 minutes or so if you want to talk individually here. And join us next month. I don't know if we'll put the slide up, but we do have another park forum coming up January 12th on the lighthearted topic of national security and diplomacy. <laughs> How entrepreneurs <laughs> can help solve that problem. <laughs>